We live at a time when everyone lies. The words were spoken by a character in Jean Renoir's 1939 film, The Rules of the Game. Those words are equally true today. All systems, be they social, cultural, spiritual, economic, financial, rely on trust. It requires the capacity to weigh up the costs and benefits of trusting others. It requires the ability to return favours in kind. It requires the ability to seek redress when trust is betrayed. When it works, the system enables strangers to deal with each other safely for mutual benefit. It is the basis of all liberal societies, democracies and economies. In attempting to deal with the global economic crises, policymakers have systematically undermined trust, trust in instruments, trust in institutions, trust between nations, trust in the political process. Everyone knows that the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows that the war is over. Everybody knows the good guys lost. Everyone knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor. The rich get rich. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. That's, of course, Leonard Cohen, the song he co-wrote with Sharon Robinson, Everybody Knows. It seems to me ironic that the breakdown should be caused by an economic crisis, not some great political or social event. But on reflection, it seems correct. Because the social compact within democratic societies requires economic growth. It requires constant improvements in living standards and increasing wealth. Today, growth has come to an end. The global economy has stalled. Employment, investment, our wealth are stagnant. The entire economic system and expectations cannot do without growth. John Steinbeck, identified this in his great novel about the Depression, The Grapes of Wrath. When the monster stops growing, it dies. It cannot stay one size. The crisis has mercilessly exposed the limits of our economic model. The rapid rise of living standards and growth were driven, we now know, by large and unsustainable increases in the level of debt and speculation. As English economist John Maynard Keynes warned, when the capital development of a country becomes a byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. The crisis has exposed the limits of policymakers' tools to restore growth. Government spending to stimulate economic activity is now severely restricted globally. Investors are reluctant to lend to heavily indebted nations. Interest rates in most developed countries are near zero. Central banks have resorted to non-conventional monetary techniques. Quantitative easing, a politically correct term for printing money. The crisis exposed other problems, rising income inequality, Increasing concentrations of wealth have been disguised by artificially engineered housing booms around the world, and yes, even in Australia, and the availability of abundant debt to finance spending. Borrowing has become a substitute for rising incomes. We now live in a society of haves, have-nots, and have not paid for what they have. <laughs> Strong economic growth papered over these problems of inequality. 
A former governor of the US Central Bank, Henry Wallach, accurately diagnosed the problem. So long as there is growth, there is hope. And that makes large income differentials tolerable. Politicians and policymakers now struggle to deliver the growth and prosperity that the electorate demands. So instead, they have turned to financial repression and political repression. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Financial repression is a term coined in 1973 by two Stanford University economists, Edward Shaw and Ronald McKinnon. It involves a variety of measures to channel funds to the government to help liquidate otherwise unsustainable debt. It does this by manipulating interest rates, regulating to force investors to buy certain types of instruments like government debt, restricting the free movement of money, nationalizations of businesses, or seizing savings. Interestingly, financial repression is generally packaged as necessary to ensure the stability and solvency of the economic and financial system. It is simply not true. A convenient lie, in fact. Let us take just one form of financial repression, low rates. Current government policy around the world is to keep interest rates low. Interestingly, in Australia, the debate about keeping interest rates low, particularly for mortgages, seems to miss the point that only 35% of people in Australia do have a mortgage. The other 70-plus percent are net savers who are actually disadvantaged by low interest rates. Returns are now artificially set below the true inflation rate. Your money loses its purchasing power, the ability to buy real things, what you need to live. An interest rate is actually a price. It is the price of money. Yet governments, with our acquiescence, are now deliberately manipulating that price through credit expansion and contraction. You ask why? It is to allow over indebted borrowers, including in many cases the state itself, to borrow at lower interest rates than they could do otherwise. To borrow far more than they could otherwise. In some cases to borrow more than they can ever repay, especially if interest rates rise. Low rates actually help reduce the value of the debt, effectively decreasing the amount of the borrowing. Simply put, it is appropriation, robbery, robbing savers to bail out borrowers. These policies debase currencies, undermining the central function of money, which is a mechanism of exchange and a store of value. Government securities, bonds, were once unquestioned stores of wealth. Now investors in government bonds are threatened by the risks of sovereigns failing. Greece is just the first carriage of the sovereign debt express which is being derailed. It will be followed by other European countries, including in the end, this crisis will reach countries which are considered now risk-free, like Germany. It will then reach Japan, and it will reach the United States, and it will reach China. Even if they don't default, governments now threaten you with the destruction of the purchasing power of your currency. Once government bonds offered risk-free return, now they offer you return-free risk. By the way, there is no evidence that low interest rates actually stimulate economic activity. The effect of low interest rates is temporary. Spending reverts to normal levels once the rates are normalized. Low rates obviously reduce the income of savers, including retirees, 
It undermines compulsory retirement saving schemes, which are designed to ensure a secure post-work life. In 2010, a fully sympathetic Bank of England Deputy Governor, Charles Bean, spoke to the UK Parliament. He said, Retirees shouldn't expect to be able to live just off their income. It may make sense for them to eat into their capital a bit. He pointed out that very often older households have actually benefited from the fact that they've seen capital gains on their houses. Let me pause the very appropriately named Mr. Bean's speech. What he was suggesting is that retirees should sell their houses, camp in the local park, and eat their capital gains. A sustained period of low rates, like the one the world is experiencing, will make it extremely difficult to increase the cost of borrowing. Levels of debt encouraged by low rates become rapidly unsustainable at higher rates. Japan today has public debt equal to 200% of gross domestic product. So their debt is equivalent to double what Japan produces in a single year. By the way, it is the highest debt among the G20. The Japanese government spends more than $2 for every dollar of tax revenue they raise. As you know, we worry about American debt, but Japan is in the gold medal winning position. The United States only spends $1.60 for every dollar of tax revenue it raises. They borrow, this is Japan, at interest rates of less than 1%. If interest rates increase to more normal rates, then Japan would not be able to sustain this level of debt. Desperate to get investors to buy government bonds, the Japanese Ministry of Finance has found a new marketing angle. Sex. They're running ads promoting ownership of government bonds. Men who hold Japanese government bonds are popular with women. <laughs> bonds get the Japanese girl, it seems. Central banks believe that they can increase rates when they want to. All addicts believe that they can quit whenever they want to. Ashley Lorenza, a former high-class escort in her journal, Sex, Drugs and Being an Escort, which I actually class as essential reading for central bankers. <laughs> she defined addiction. When you give up something, or rather when you can give up something, any time, as long as it's next Tuesday. <laughs> Our policymakers are following the advice of actress Tallulah Bankhead. Cocaine isn't habit forming. I should know. I've been using it for years. <laughs> Reliance on low interest rates, like all addictions, is dangerous. It's also ineffective in addressing the real economic issues. Many nations have used regulations and political pressure to force local banks to adopt patriotic balance sheets. What this means is they're forcing their banks to buy government bonds and lend only to domestic borrowers. Under official pressures, European banks have now withdrawn from international activities, leaving a large hole that others must fill. Australian banks, corporations and governments face a shortfall of around about $35 billion this year as a result of the decision of European banks not to renew loans to people in this part of the world. But more aggressive forms of financial repression are also increasing. When Greece's debt was restructured, the European Central Bank used retrospective legislation to deliberately prefer official cre creditors themselves, allowing them to avoid losses at the expense of other creditors. Unsurprisingly now, investors are reluctant to lend to other European governments, fearing adverse future changes in their legal status. In some countries, governments have seized private savings. In Portugal, the government has actually seized pension funds to meet their budget deficits this year. Last year, 
to make the budget balance, they seized the actual pension funds of the state-owned telecommunications company, Portugal Telecom. Everywhere, money is being directed into approved government investments. Argentina has seized pension savings, the foreign currency reserves of the central bank, and renationalized the national oil company, allowing the government access to about 1.2 billion of annual profits. The timing was exquisite, because the majority owner of the Argentine oil company was the Spanish oil company, Repsol. And as one Argentine official said, we don't think the Spanish will be able to muster an armada under the conditions prevailing to come and take it back. <laughs> the European Central Bank, which oversees the Eurozone, the 17-nation Eurozone, has begun to finance governments, something which it is explicitly forbidden from doing under European Union treaties. Jans Wiedemann, who is the president of the German Central Bank, the Bundesbank, warned in November last year, I cannot see how you can ensure the stability of a monetary union by violating its legal provisions. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. The financial crisis revealed numerous instances of financial institutions placing their own interest before clients and exploiting unsophisticated customers for egregious profits. On the 14th of April this year, a former Goldman Sachs executive director, Greg Smith, published a sensational exit interview in the New York Times. The letter criticized toxic and destructive practices and cultures within Goldman Sachs, which, as you know, is one of the world's largest, most important and influential investment banks and is generally a model for others. Senior executives of the firm have held senior positions in the US government, leading to the firm actually being christened not Goldman Sachs, but Government Sachs. The letter followed a series of damaging disclosures about Goldman Sachs, a firm which Rolling Stones magazine journalist Matt Taibbi labelled a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. The criticism highlighted practices and a culture that was focused on getting clients to invest in securities or products that Goldman was interested in offloading. The letter highlighted the use of complexity to confuse clients, it highlighted the focus on highly profitable and sometimes unsophisticated clients who did not fully understand the risks of transaction that they were being encouraged by Goldman Sachs to enter. In 2010, a Senate Investigation and Securities and Exchange Commission action highlighted Goldman Sachs' suspect practices surrounding the sale of certain mortgage-backed securities known as Abacus and Timberwolf. Examination of several terabytes, billions of pages of emails revealed Thomas Montag, a senior Goldman executive and now an even more senior executive at Bank of America, describing one CDO, Timber Wolf, as one shitty deal. During a Senate hearing, Goldman's chief financial officer, David Vinia, was asked, when you heard that your employees in these emails when looking at these deals, said, God, what a shitty deal. Do you feel anything? Vinia responded, I think that's very unfortunate to have in an email. <laughs> Subsequently, Goldman have instituted policies against using swear words in emails. <laughs> Choosing to clean up the language rather than their sales practices. The SEC indictment had humour because they indicted Fabrice Touré, a French employee of Goldman's, who sold the Abacus deals to unwitting widows and orphans. Among tender emails to his girlfriend, Cerise, the super-smart French girl in London, the self-styled fabulous fab, told us a lot about the workings of Goldman Sachs. The whole building is about to collapse any time now. Only potential survivor, the fabulous fab, standing in the middle of all these complex, highly leveraged, exotic trades he created without necessarily understanding all the implications of those monstrosities. 
He wrote that abacus was pure intellectual masturbation, a thing which has no purpose, which is absolutely conceptual and highly theoretical, and which nobody knows how to price. But Ture himself had no doubt. Anyway, not to feeling too guilty about this, the real purpose of my job is to make capital markets more efficient and ultimately provide the US consumer with more efficient ways to leverage and finance himself. So there is a humble, noble, and ethical reason for my job. Amazing how good I am in convincing myself. Goldman executives generally seem to have trouble with the English language. The following exchange took place during the U.S. Senate hearings into these transactions. Senator Carl Levine, don't you have a duty to disclose an adverse interest to your client? Do you have that duty? Dan Sparks, head of Goldman Sachs Mortgage Trading, about? Senator Levine, if you have an adverse interest to your client, do you have a duty to disclose that to your client. Sparks, um, the question about how the firm is positioned or our desk is positioned? Senator Levine, if you have an adverse interest to your client when you're selling them something to them, do you have a responsibility to tell your client of your adverse interest? Sparks, Mr. Chairman, I am just trying to understand what the adverse interest means. Yeah. Strangely, this exchange actually mirrored a comedy sketch a few years earlier featuring British comedians John Bird and John Fortune, known as the Two Johns. Interviewer, can we talk about moral hazard? Banker, about what? <laughs> Interviewer, moral hazard. Banker, I know what hazard means. What's the other word? In July 2010, Goldman Sachs settled the matter, paying a $550 million fine, which is a record. But it's only 4% of its annual earnings of $13 billion. Charles Geist, author of a famous history on Wall Street, was unimpressed. A fine is not going to bother these people. It's like passing around the church collection plate and collecting a few extra bucks for sins. A former counsel to the US Central Bank observed, it's all about the score. Just make the score, do the deal, move on to the next one. That's the trader culture. In the lead-up to the financial crisis, financial executives paid themselves high salaries and bonuses based on dubious, often manipulated profits. Even in the aftermath of the crisis, there is a voracious desire for large bonuses. Aiding banks that governments were forced to support have sought to reward their executives. Barack Obama asked Timothy Geithner in a celebrated exchange. So let me get this straight. They were insolvent, so we gave them money, so they now take the money and pay it to themselves as bonuses. <laughs> Martin Wolf, the economic commentator of the Financial Times, described the finance industry as a risk-loving industry guaranteed by the government as a public utility. The inability or unwillingness of governments to rein in this industry further affects our trust. As Adam Smith bemoaned, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else seems in every age to have been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. Reviled and mistrusted, financial institutions throughout the world are losing all legitimacy. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. The lack of trust in governments, banks, and global finance manifests itself in different ways. There's growing interest in alternative paper money, the Bavarian Chimagawa, England's Lewis Pound, or the Berkshires program in Massachusetts. These are alternative currencies, like normal money, except they're designed to encourage local business and emphasize community values. They have a limited acceptance. It can only be accepted within a small area, and sometimes they have a finite expiry date. So if you haven't spent it, you lose it. Greeks, especially in rural areas, have been forced back into even more primitive times, relying now on barter. Savers are reversing what has been a historic trend to the abstraction of property through paper currency. They're forced to do this to preserve the value of their savings. 
the ultra-rich are so disillusioned with financial instruments, they're switching from these types of financial investments to real assets. They're buying gold, they're buying commodities, they're buying farmland, fine arts and other collectibles. For those of you who have money, the best investment you could have made last year in terms of performance was vintage cars. In the US, there was Bank Transfer Day, an online phenomenon started by an unhappy Bank of America client. Disgruntled customers withdrew money from traditional banks that day, transferring it to not-for-profit credit unions owned by their members. There is the growth of what we call peer-to-peer -peer lending, which facilitates matching savers and borrowers for small consumer loans. But the loss of trust in the financial system is very damaging. A switch to these alternative currencies, precious metals, and non-financial investments undermines growth and economic activity. Because savings are locked in unproductive investments and are unavailable to circulate freely. Everyone knows that the boat is leaking. Everyone knows that the captain lied. Everyone's got this broken feeling, like their father or their dog just died. Trust between nations is being destroyed. Developed countries have chosen policies that devalue their currencies through a combination of low interest rates and increasing the supply of money through the printing presses. These actions erode the value of government bonds. China, Japan and Germany have invested their national savings, the savings of their people in these now devaluing securities. This too undermines global trust. Nations are manipulating the value of currencies to allow them to capture a greater share of global trade, boosting growth, their own growth. But one nation's gain is another nation's loss. A calculate policy to secure unfair trading advantages threatens tit for tat currency wars, reminiscent of the 1930s. Bigger than a neighbour, policies exacerbate international tensions, manifesting itself in trade protectionism and trade disputes. What is buying Australian other than a form of trade restriction? Low interest rates and weak currencies have also driven money into emerging nations, where rates are higher and stronger growth prospects exist. These volatile money flows have the potential to destabilize these economies, derailing their development. The devaluation of the US dollar has driven up the price of commodities such as food and energy, which are basically denominated and traded in the American currency. In poorer countries, where spending on food and energy, including everyday essentials like cooking oil, is a high proportion of income, this is causing great hardship. These developments are now threatening to reverse progress in reducing poverty. Under the guise of regulations needed to strengthen the financial system, the US is implementing measures with extravagant extraterritorial application to give American banks a business advantage. These measures do not foster international cooperation. But that's how it goes. Everybody knows. But there are other symptoms of increasing international mistrust. America supported Europe's candidacy for the IMF president, Christian Lagarde, the permanently tanned champion synchronized swimmer. <laughs> Europe helped elect the American candidate, Jim Yong Kim, as head of the World Bank. The US and Europe used its disproportionate voting power to achieve this outcome. Speaking at an IMF press conference, Brazil's finance minister highlighted the inequality of the quotas that dictate voting power. The calculated quota share of Luxembourg, by the way, if you blink as you drive, you'll miss Luxembourg, is larger than the one for Argentina or South Africa. The quota share for Belgium is larger than that of Indonesia and roughly three times that of Nigeria. And the quota of Spain, amazing as it may seem, is larger than the sum total of the quotas of the entire 44 sub-Saharan African countries. This imbalance is a legacy of a time when the IMF was designed to help 
the third world and developing countries. But the IMF's purpose is now different. The developed countries now need the savings of the emerging nations to try to solve their debt problems, particularly the one in Europe. In April 2012, the IMF increased its resources by US $430 billion to help deal with the potential financial crisis. Christian Lagarde at Davos, because she's a Davos woman, she's a Davos woman, turned up and was asked why she was there and she produced her designer handbag, Gucci, I think, and said she had brought a little bag to collect money. But of that US $430 million in additional commitments, emerging nations chipped in around $150 billion. Interestingly, the US refused to contribute the requisite US $70 billion based on its jealously protected voting quotas. IMF officials made obligatory statements that the funds were available for the whole IMF membership, not earmarked for any particular region, but everyone knows that the funds are likely to be needed to solve the Eurozone debt crisis. Emerging markets in Asia remember US Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers' criticism of crony capitalism. They remember the strict conditions that international organizations placed on emergency loans. They remember the hardships inflicted on Asia. I remember one particular incident very well. It was in 1998, walking near my hotel in Jakarta with an Indonesian friend. We overheard a conversation. Her mother and her two daughters were discussing who would sell herself, prostitute herself, to feed the family. Emerging countries resent the fact that the conditions for the bailouts of Greece, of Ireland and Portugal, and soon to come of Spain and Italy, will be noticeably less rigorous than those imposed on Asian countries after the Asian monetary crisis in 97-98. Citizens in China, Brazil and Russia, where incomes per head are well below Western levels, they are something like one-fifth to one-tenth of Western European salaries, now risk large losses to preserve the unsustainable monetary and economic arrangements of these developed nations. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. Financial repression is increasingly now accompanied by political repression. Governments have systematically lied about the severity of the crisis. On 20th of April 2007, speaking on US television, Treasury Secretary Henry Hank Paulson, a former chief executive of Goldman Sachs, was upbeat. The US economy is robust and very healthy, and the housing market is at or near the bottom. The head of the US Central Bank, Ben Bernanke, told Congress, we've never had a decline in house prices on a nationwide basis, so what I think what is more likely is that house prices will slow, maybe stabilize, might slow consumption, spending a bit. I don't think it's going to drive the economy too far from its full employment path. US housing prices are 35 to 40% below the day Ben Bernanke spoke, with probably another 10% downside. US employment is now 140 million people versus 146 million on the day he spoke. Here were two men who had jumped off a 50-story building without a parachute, saying that it was all plain sailing so far <laughs> as they passed the 40th floor. <laughs> on 11th of April last year, Spanish Finance Minister Elena Salgado said, I do not see any risk of contagion. We are totally out of this. She was right. She was entirely out of it. <laughs> Earlier this year, the voters agreed, voting her out of it, at least government. Interestingly, her successors have continued the policy. Her replacement as finance minister, Luis de Guindos, this year on 30th of March, stated, we are convinced that Spain will no longer be a problem, especially for the Spanish, but also for the European Union. The Spanish Prime Minister, Marino Rajoy, attempted to maintain confidence a few days later, on the 12th of April, 
with this following confusing statement. To talk about a bailout for Spain at the moment makes no sense. Spain is not going to be rescued. It is not possible to rescue Spain. There's no intention to. It's not necessary. And therefore, it's not going to be rescued. But it is in Germany that the suppression of debate has reached extraordinary heights, reminiscent of the best, the very best, of Soviet propaganda. Afraid of debate and transparency of German policy to support bailouts, Chancellor Angela Merkel has only spoken once on the issue within Germany. Not in Parliament, but in an hour-long interview on TV, the equivalent of Good Morning Australia with Kerry ann Kennelly. The presenter was tame, allowing Mrs. Dr. Merkel rather, to get away with a stream of uninterrupted motherhood statements. She claimed unchallenged that there was no Euro crisis. There was no attempt to seriously explain her policies. After the Bundestag, the German parliament, voted to approve the European bailouts, a television crew ambushed some MPs and asked them some basic questions. They wanted to know how much money was Germany giving, which countries would receive the money. The majority of parliamentarians could not answer these simple questions correctly. Some believed that only Greece had received money. Actually, Ireland and Portugal had also received money and the fund was available for European banks. Almost none could tell the amount of the German commitment. A few billion, I guess? The correct answer was Euro 211 billion. The largest single sum of money a German parliament has ever committed to any cause. European governments have deliberately moved key decisions outside the ambit of the electorate and parliaments. The German Constitutional Court ruled that several decisions by Chancellor Angela Merkel's government in relation to the bailouts were unconstitutional. Future actions would need to be approved by the Bundestag, the German parliament. Immediately, to avoid scrutiny, German leaders moved key decisions into opaque European Union forums. Smaller countries can find themselves arbitrarily included or excluded from crucial decisions. Finland was extended special terms securing part of their commitments to the European bailout. Apparently, they had asked unsuccessfully, it was rumoured, for security over some Greek islands. As one of the few AAA-rated countries remaining in the Eurozone, there'll be less by next year, Finland's support for the bailout was seen as crucial, allowing it to obtain preference. On other matters, important decisions were made privately by Mercosi, the sarcastic term for the partnership of convenience between the German Chancellor and the former French President, Nicolas Sarkozy. Decisions on the bailout of Greece and the draconian austerity measures were dictated by the European Union, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund to the Greeks with limited involvement of the Greek government. In fact, my advice to the Greek, uh, one of the Greek uh, people I talked to, I said, why are they going to these meetings? They should go to the Taverna and have a Raki because they're going to need it anyway afterwards, but they might as well have one now, because their presence is absolutely unnecessary. Because to give you some idea of the process, the money that Greece was being given was not going to go to Greece anyway. It was going to be put into an escrow account and then immediately directed back to the lenders to Greece. The entire process has never had anything to do with the Greeks. Greek Prime Minister George Papandreou bravely made a short-lived an ultimately ill-advised attempt to have a plebiscite on the austerity policies. The larger European states and the European Union dismissed this as disruptive. Subsequently, the European Union orchestrated the replacement of the Greek Prime Minister 
and subsequently the Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. European policymakers appear to believe that a suspension of democracy and sovereignty is the answer to everything. They believe that the implementation by trusted technocrats or centrally determined policies will secure the future. I remember something that Bertolt Brecht wrote. Watching the suppression of workers' protests in East Berlin in 1953, he observed, the people having lost the confidence of the government, the government finds it necessary to dissolve the people and appoint a new one. <laughs> the crisis has undermined the relationship between voters and elected politicians and policymakers in many countries. This is increasingly evident in Europe. The decline in the electoral support of major parties and the rise of smaller parties testify to this discontent. The two major Greek parties normally poll 70% of the vote. They poll less than 35. 70% went to French parties. These are parties like Germany's Pirate Party, which, believe it or not, dress up as pirates and have only one policy, so it's simple to understand. No censorship of the internet. They're polling 10%. <laughs> and that would give them a significant stake in the uh, German Bundestag, probably on a par with the Greens. Then there is Europe's resurgent far right, the National Front in France, in Greece the Golden Dreams, who walk around with iron bars trying to evict immigrants, legal or illegal, from Greece. And there is equivalence in Finland, in Holland, and a number of other countries. The global Occupy Wall Street movement Street protests in Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy are all fueled by this breakdown in trust. But in the European endgame, and that is now beginning, will be the most interesting because it will affect Germany. Ordinary Germans will have to pay twice for the single currency. In the early 2000s, they paid for the single currency through reductions in real wages, unemployment, labour market reform weakening protections. Now they will have to pay again for the bailouts. Those losses will be in the vicinity of between 800 billion to a trillion and a half euros, which is equivalent to basically half of what Germany produces in a year. Voters will discover that they have been betrayed by Germany's pro-Europe political elite. There will be an electoral revolt and as in the rest of Europe there will be a challenge from radical political forces in Germany. Given European and especially German history that is not a reassuring prospect. We now have a broken political system to go with our broken economic and financial system. A democracy deficit is as now as much of the problem as a budget deficit and a trade deficit. That's how it goes. Everybody knows. In the short run, ordinary people paying for the cost of the crisis are angry, but trust is mutual, requiring two parties. The complicity of ordinary people is difficult to ignore. Many ordinary people were investors directly or indirectly through retirement schemes. They turned a blind eye to excess. Investors ignored generous pay packets for bankers while the bankers made investors richer and facilitate growth. Homeowners did not complain when their properties rose in value. Socially progressive people accepted the position of graffiti artist Banksy. We can't do anything in the world until capitalism crumbles. In the meantime, we should all go shopping to console ourselves. In New York, two fund managers were charged with criminal offences after the fund failed and investors lost all their money. They were found not guilty. A member of the jury said that not only were they innocent, but she would be happy to have them manage her money. 1980s New York downtown performance artist Sue Ann Harkey captured our acquiescence. 
It's not about them, it's about us. We are them and they are us. I have no pride. I have no shame. I have no guilt hiding behind blame. A widening gap between the views and concerns of the people and the political and bureaucratic classes now threatens the fragile compact at the heart of free societies. The risk of economic, social, political and international breakdown is now very real. The effects of reduction in living standards, reduced wealth, social hardships for the worst affected members of society are highly unpredictable. In 1944, President Roosevelt, if you recall, called for a second Bill of Rights, recognizing that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Roosevelt's words are still relevant today. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. In March 1933, John Maynard Keynes wrote, We have reached a critical point. We can see clearly the gulf to which our present path is leading if governments did not take action. We must expect the progressive breakdown of the existing structure of contract and instruments of indebtedness accompanied by the utter discredit of orthodox leadership in finance and government. With what ultimate outcome we cannot predict that warning is relevant today. In seeking to resolve the financial crisis, politicians, central bankers, policymakers have destroyed the trust that is central to modern societies. Once fractured, this trust will not be easy to reestablish. Friedrich Nietzsche nailed it. I'm not upset that you lied to me. I am upset that from now on, I can't believe you. Or as Lady Gaga put it in a much more direct and modern way, trust is like a mirror. You can fix it if it's broken, but you can still see the crack in that motherfucker's reflection. And everyone knows that the plague is coming. Everybody knows that it's moving fast. Everybody knows that you're in trouble. Everybody knows that it's coming apart. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. Everybody. Nice.